Again, welcome to all of you, our Truman scholars. We are indeed very proud of you. Tonight, you're in for a special treat. Tikva is committed to introducing Jewish youth to the best that has been said and written in the West and in the Jewish canon. Part of that exposure to excellence means introducing you to the truly great teachers of today's world, the worlds of academia, the worlds of public policy, the rabbinic worlds, and tonight we're going to do just that. There's a passage in the Talmud that I'm often reminded of when I think about greatness and the exposure to greatness that is so much at the core of what Tikva does and what we aspire to. The Talmud says, Hani Bavlai Tipshai Shekamu Kame Sefer Torah Lo Kamu Kame Gavra Rabba. How these foolish Babylonians, they rise for the Sefer Torah, for the written scroll of the Torah, but they don't rise for a great individual. They don't rise for a great scholar. See, we often think about greatness as something abstract, something theoretical, something that we can't reach. But there are precious few, perhaps, but there are people out there that qualify as truly great. And when we try to introduce you to greatness, we try to introduce you to the greatest teachers that are alive today. And tonight you're going to meet one of the greatest teachers, one of the greatest teachers that I've encountered in my life, my colleagues who are fortunate enough to work at the Tikkun Fund and that meet this great woman day in, day out. Her name, as Rabbi Jacobson already mentioned, is Dr. Ruth Weiss. Dr. Ruth Weiss was formerly the Martin Peretz Professor of Yiddish and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Prior to her appointment at Harvard, she served in McGill University for many, many years, actually her alma mater. And she is the author of numerous books, including Jews in Power, Jewish Jokes, and countless articles, from political theory to Zionism to literature and Jewish thought. One of the things that marks Dr. Weiss as a truly great scholar is not just her CV chock full of publications, not just her own passion for her discipline and her one-of-a-kind pioneering of the field of Jewish studies of literature, of Yiddish in particular, but the quality that most stands out for me is her desire to continue to learn, to continue to grow and to continue to learn despite her many accomplishments and her accolades and her position as perhaps the preeminent scholar of Yiddish literature working today. Despite all this, she's still always looking for new ideas, looking to have a conversation with you, looking to learn from your own wisdom and learning. And this very much accords with the Jewish concept of scholarship, where it's not just the chacham, it's not just the wise person, it's the tamid chacham, or the tamida chachama in this case. Someone who's also always studying, also always learning, also always looking to advance and enhance their own scholarship, their own learning, not just satisfied to give, but also looking to receive more and more. And tonight, she has the perfect interlocutor in Tikva's CEO, our Chief Executive Officer, Eric Cohen. Eric Cohen, before taking the position as Executive De Director and now CEO at the Tikva Fund, was himself the creator and founder and publisher of the New Atlantis magazine, a journal in ethics and technology. He was a member of the Presidential Council on Bioethics, a student and colleague of the great Dr. Leon Cass, someone who also takes the craft of teaching and learning as seriously as, as you can imagine. And Eric has not only learned to be a great CEO, but he's learned to be a great analyzer and a great questioner, someone who understands a text and can cut to the chase or cut to the quick and ask that powerful question, that potent question that gets to the heart of the matter. So tonight you're in for a treat 
As I said, you're in for this wonderful dialogue, this wonderful conversation between Eric Cohen and Dr. Ruth Weiss on the subject of two chosen or almost chosen nations as they reflect themselves in the poetry, especially of the great Jewish poetess Emma Lazarus. So please enjoy, please focus on what you can each learn from Dr. Weiss and Mr. Cohen, and certainly take this learning with you throughout the rest of the year and the summer ahead. Mazel tov on your first semester's accomplishments, and we look forward to what's ahead. Have a good evening. It's really great to be with you tonight for this exciting chance to learn with Professor Weiss. So we have really three aims tonight in this conversation. The first is to expose you to a great teacher. In my mind, being exposed to a great teacher, the right moment with the right ideas can really change your life. And, and, and Ruth Weiss is one of the real master educators in the Jewish world today. I've had the chance to learn so much from you over the years. Um, you've really changed my life in important ways. And we're really honored to pass that wisdom along, that engagement, that encounter with such an important Jewish mind and educator to all of you, you young students who have so much to learn and so much to live for as Jews and as Americans. The second purpose tonight is to expose you to the importance of poetry. Poetry isn't studied enough anymore, but we need poems. We need poetry. As Jews and as Americans, poems kindle, rekindle, restore, embolden the spirit. They help us understand who we are as Jews, as Americans, as Zionists. We need great poetry, and we want to introduce you to two great poems tonight. They'll hopefully kindle in you a love of the poetic voice and of the poetic mind. And finally, the purpose for tonight is to bridge the two parts of this program that you've begun. This program is about two exceptional nations, two chosen nations, or a chosen nation and an almost chosen nation, America and Israel. And you've been on this intellectual journey from the American founding to the late 1800s, and that's where our story will pick up tonight when we begin with this poem by Emma Lazarus. And we want to bridge you to these two visions of the Jewish experience, the American Jewish experience and what America means as a bastion of Jewish freedom and Jewish liberty, and the experience of Israel, a nation not yet come into being, where we pick it up tonight with this poem written in 1947. So that's what we hope to do together over the next many minutes, half hour or so. Um, and hopefully this will be in a powerful way to think about what you've learned already, what you're going to learn next year with us, and these two epicenters of the Jewish spirit and the Jewish soul, America and Israel. So that's our mission tonight. We have no better person to guide us than you, Ruth. And I think we should start with this poem, The New Colossus, written by Emma Lazarus in 1883. Thank you. Um, may, I, <clears throat> may I begin by saying that the honor this evening is mine um, to teach all of you after the year that you've had and are going to have is, um, is really very daunting. And uh, I wish Eric had not built up this expectation uh, because, um, you know, there's a lot to say about these poems. I would say that I see myself here as basically the um, introducer um, you are out there, this is the poem, I would like you to meet one another, and this is just a way basically of introducing poems that you're going to live with, I think, forever. So this is the New Colossus by Emma Lazarus that is there at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. It was put there on a plaque, and if you go to the Statue of Liberty, you can see this poem. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor the Twin Cities frame. Keep Ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, 
tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, um, many people know some of the words, the last part of this poem, almost by heart, because it has come to stand for the spirit of America. But when I really began to study this poem, to look into it, I was amazed at what Emma Lazarus had done. She'd done something very bold, because here is the background of this. This statue, the Statue of Liberty, was actually commissioned from the French sculptor, very famous sculptor at the time, Frédéric Auguste Bertoldi, and it was commissioned in order to represent liberty enlightening the world. And what the French wanted to do was to pass the torch of liberty that had been kindled through the French Revolution to the Americans, now that it was after the American Revolution. And it was given as a gift by the people of France to the United States as a symbolic passing of the torch, okay? Now, the torch in Lady Liberty's right hand, which for a time, by the way, served as a lighthouse, represented the flame of reason that had sparked the Enlightenment and ignited the French Revolution. So the tablets that she carries in her left hand linked the American Declaration of Independence to the biblical tablets of the law. And you will understand this in terms of the Hebraic roots of America. And it was modeled, this huge statue was modeled on the Colossus of Rhodes, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was no longer standing uh, after the third century before the common era, but it had been put up in the harbor of Rhodes by the people in order to represent an, a victory over their enemies, okay? So this is the statue that we're talking about. Now, here comes Emma Lazarus, born 1849 in New York to a very prominent Jewish family. She was an amazing person, clearly. She began to write poetry when she was a very young girl. Her father published her first book of poetry. Um, by 1883, she was already a published poet and she was a member of the literary society of Boston and of New York, the New England Literary Society. She had met Emerson, uh, she had translated from the German, uh, she'd written essays on literature, she was much sought after as an author. And so in 1883, when the commission uh, for the statue had to raise money because the French had not paid for putting up the statue in the harbor. So the Americans had to raise the money to uh, actually erect the statue there. They decided that they would raise money, among other ways, by collecting a kind of booklet and having a, a, a ceremony to represent it. And they invited, of course, Emma Lazarus to contribute something. And this is the sonnet that she contributed. And it was the sonnet the only work that was, that was uh, read aloud at that dedication meeting was her sonnet. And it was published in the newspapers and it made at the time an enormous impression. And then fast forward in 1903, when uh, the statue was formally dedicated, there was a contest and this sonnet was chosen. She was long since dead, but the sonnet was chosen to be placed on the Statue of Liberty as its kind of framework. And when we think of the Statue of Liberty, I mean, these, these are the words with which it is associated. Emma Lazarus's poem is the poem with which this great statue is uh, associated. Now, when you think of it, look at how bold she was. You see, by 1883, Emma Lazarus was not only an acclaimed poet, but she had been in the harbor. She had been at Ward Island, which was the precursor of Ellis Island. And in 1881, there were pogroms in Russia. Uh, the situation of Russian Jews changed very radically. And there was the beginning of a mass exodus, which eventually brought two and a half million Jews to America. 
Now, she worked with those refugees. Those were the years when the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society was founded. And she worked with those refugees. She worked with them in the years immediately preceding 1883. That's one thing. The second thing that is so important to know about her is that she had become, I should say, uh, overwhelmed by the idea of what came to be known as Zionism. Seeing these refugees um, and feeling what was happening in America too, and reading Daniel Deronda, which I hope some of you will read, one of my favorite novels, one of the great novels, which is uh, about uh, building the land of Israel, if you will. Um, having read that, having also been very influenced by that, she had become what came to be known as a Zionist. In other words, she was, uh, as um, Esther Shore in this biography, by the way, a very good biography of uh, Emma Lazarus, what um, uh, Esther Shore writes is that she was the first well-known American to begin publicly making the case for a Jewish state. So this is Emma Lazarus, this remarkable young woman, who, by the way, was only 38 years old when she died. So we're talking about a fairly young person here. She had done all of this. And you can see how much of that spirit is here in this poem. Why do I say this is so bold? Look at what she does here. Um, she changes the whole nature of this statue. If you take a look at the eyes of the statue, mild is the last word that you would ever use for them. This is all head. This is enlightenment. And what she does is she transforms this into the mother of exiles. And instead of a statue that is for victory, as all the statues of Europe always were, armed might and armed power and victory, she says, no, this statue is the mother of exiles. And what is greatness for America? Greatness is extending its welcome to all these people who have no home. And she describes them, the tired, the poor, the tempest tossed, tossed around by storms. These were people whom she had seen so she knew how troubled they were and how much in need of shelter they were. And so it's a transforming poem. And incredibly, this redefines, I would say, this redefines America to itself. And America then really begins to be perceived, of course, by the people coming into the harbor who want to see the statue as a welcoming statue, but also by the people in America because they're the ones actually who choose to put the, the tablet there. So why do you think this young American Jewish poet was uniquely able to give voice to what America meant or could mean as a mother of exiles? Meaning, what, what do you think in her experience gave her this vision of America that has now become so central to America's understanding of itself as a, as a country. Well, this is complicated because I think that in order to know this from her perspective, one would have to get a real sense of who this person was. But reading about her, I would say there were a couple of things. For one thing, she saw that the people who read Daniel Deronda, as she did, the wonderful Gentile friends that she had, we're not so sympathetic to the idea of the Jews. In fact, she encountered a lot of genteel anti-Jewishness. Oh, they liked her well enough. They didn't discriminate against her, but they expected her to become like them. They didn't like the Jewishness of her. They liked her, but not her Jewishness. So as time went on, she had become more and more Jewish. And, and I think that she felt that she could interpret the country from a Jewish perspective. Interpret America. Interpret America. Why not? Why not she? I mean, she was a, an American after all, a third generation American, right? She was not a newcomer to this country. Why shouldn't she be the one 
to interpret America as she felt it, as she knew it. And in fact, was she wrong? In fact, we still speak of America. I mean, there's a large debate in this country about immigration, but almost everybody says we are a country of immigrants. We like to see ourselves as a welcoming nation. So, but, but the interesting thing you also hear about her is that you see this statue, and to me, perhaps one of the most fascinating things, the statue you see was given to make the connection between Europe and America. We're alike. We're the same. Now, what she does that I think is most revolutionary, if you will, is she says, not. And if you read this poem, you can see that what she's saying, what a, your storied pomp, you can keep that Europe. America is a refuge from Europe, <laughs> not a continuity of all of Europe. We are a refuge from Europe. So this is a, you know, very, very interesting. America is a land where Jews can breathe free. Exactly. America is a land where Jews can breathe free, and therefore, these other immigrants, the Jews were not the only immigrants coming, Italian immigrants, Russian immigrants, this is a country where you can breathe free, not as you did in your European countries. Right. But, but maybe, maybe it took this young Jewish poet to explain America, because she understood in some deep way what it meant to be an exile, and then to find a homeland. That is, that is so. She did or not. Or at least a temporary homeland. Well, for her, yes. Because she was also a Zionist. She was also a Zionist, but I think that she did not see a contradiction between these two things. She did not see that it had to be a choice between a Jewish land, a homeland for the Jewish people in the land of Israel, and also a land for all exiles, for all immigrants in the United States of America. And don't forget, this was after the Civil War. And so the freeing of the slaves was also a great part of this. This was already now a country which was formally, which had freed its slaves and built into that idea of a free country, what it really meant. So you mentioned what was going on at the time for Jews in Russia. And so if you shift, we shift our frame from America as a place where Jews can breathe free you know, again, talking about this is the 1880s, right. or at least can hope to breathe free. Right. And then you look at what's going on for Jews in Europe, in Russia, where that hope is a hope not being realized. Right. Um, and the very pain of the Jewish people, the suffering, right. you mentioned the pogroms, begins to strengthen this yearning not simply to breathe free, but to breathe free as Jews in our own homeland. That's Zionism. That's wonderfully put. So, <laughs> yes. so maybe that's a way to bridge now to this other poem. This poem that, you know, is written many years later in 1947. Right. But before there is a modern Israel, which doesn't yes. come into being until one year later in 1948. But I think it's fair to say this poem, in certain ways, helped give it birth. So what, what is this other poem about? What gave it birth? When was it written? Maybe we should look at that. Oh, absolutely. And this does make the transition, I think, in your year of learning, uh, also from America to, uh, exactly. to Israel. So this is, as I said, the... The silver uh, platter. The silver platter. And I would just say that in the same way that the... Um, poem of the Statue of Liberty, the New Colossus, is one of the most famous poems of America. Certainly the Silver Platter is one of the most famous poems in Israel. If you were living in Israel, if you were educated in Israel, you would know this poem. And you wouldn't know it from having studied it in school necessarily. You would know it because on every Yom Hazikaron, on every Remembrance Day in Israel, and sometimes on the day of independence in Israel, this poem is featured. Uh, there's no one who doesn't know it. So let me read this too, good. Uh, in this translation, 
And the land will grow still, crimson skies dimming, misting, slowly paling again over smoking frontiers. As the nation stands up, torn at heart, but existing, to receive its first wonder in 2,000 years. As the moment draws near, it will rise, darkness facing, stand straight in the moonlight, in terror and joy, when across from it, step out towards it, slowly pacing in plain sight of all, a young girl and a boy. Dressed in battle gear, dirty shoes heavy with grime, on the path they will climb up while their lips remain sealed, to change garb, to wipe brow they have not yet found time, still bone weary from days and from nights in the field. Full of endless fatigue and all drained of emotion, yet the dew of their youth is still seen on their head. Thus like statues they stand, stiff and still, with no motion, and no sign that will show if they live or are dead. Then a nation in tears and amazed at this matter will ask, who are you? And the two will then say with soft voice, we are the silver platter on which the Jews' state was presented today. Then they fall back in darkness as the dazed nation looks, and the rest can be found in the history books. So, um, so what was going on when this poem was well, written? What was going on? Uh, again, the occasion for this. So on the 29th of November, 1947, a momentous day, the United Nations voted for the partition of Palestine. Uh, now the celebration of what that... What does that mean, voted for the partition of Palestine? Well, this was, you know, the United Nations had been founded in 1945. The British had the mandate for Palestine. The British saw that they could not any longer be there between the Arabs and the Jewish population. The Jews had been promised the land of Palestine, much of it, but the British had given much of it to Jordan, to Transjordan. But now the case had come before the United Nations, and the United Nations was then to vote on whether Palestine would be partitioned between the Jews. Partition meaning split. Split between the Jews and the Arab population. Um, now the land that was being given to the Jews was minuscule compared to what they had been promised and to what we consider to be the land of Israel. But Ben-Gurion, who was then the leader of the country, and I think the population itself said, one will accept whatever it is. This will be what we will do. And, and the United Nations voted. Now, Chaim Weizmann, for example, was one of the people who had come to the United States the lobbying for that was tremendous because Arab opposition... So Weizmann was one of the leaders of the Zionist movement. Right, and he became the first president of right. the state of Israel. He was one of the leaders. And all around the world, Jews who had any kind of influence were trying to go to all these countries that were then members of the United Nations to plead with them, to argue with them, to persuade them to vote for the partition of Palestine. And as the roll call was called, well, I remember this as a child, you know. Uh, I mean, people would sit at, sat by the radio and, and just hung on every vote. Yes, no, abstain. And by the time it came to Uruguay, it was, it was done. I mean, it was amazing. The United States voted for it. Uh, the Soviet Union at that time voted for it. I mean, how the, it, everybody considered it's part of a miracle, right, that this happened. So in Tel Aviv, 1947, that night in Tel Aviv, there was the most famous cafe in Tel Aviv was called Kassit, and it was where the whole literary community gathered. And one of the people there that night was Natan Alterman, who was one of the great poets, already acknowledged as one of the great young poets of Israel. And when the vote came through, the place went 
wild. And as a matter of fact, the owner of the cafe, this is, was considered one of the miracles, opened champagne bottles and gave everybody champagne to drink. And it is recorded that Natan Alterman was very sober. And one of the other sober people that night was apparently Chaim Weizmann, because he was quoted in the paper in Israel several days later as having said, a state does not come to a people on a silver platter. And in Davar, the newspaper for which Natan Alterman wrote, these words were headlined, kind of. A state is not given to a people on a silver platter. And that platter. phrase, a silver platter, means what? Well, it's an English phrase. Right. You see, he, he said it. It's interesting that this is a Hebrew poem right. that used the English phrase. What he meant was, you know, you're not, no one's going to hand you this. You're going to have to work for it. Right. And he had already worked for it. So maybe what he meant was that, look, we had to put in a lot of effort in order to get this state. But what he also meant was, listen, people out there, Jewish people out there, this is not going to come to you so easily. The Arabs are not going to give up their claims. There's probably going to be a war. They knew that there was going to be a war. They didn't know that all five armies would come at them, but they were prepared. Um, and, um, and so that was what he meant. It's not going to be handed to you so easily. Natan Alterman took these words, and he had a column every Friday in Davar, the most read newspaper at that time. And um, in the Friday column, three weeks later, came this poem, which essentially, um, you know, you can see how moving it is. What he does is he begins with this, do you, if you see the Hebrew, do you see that letter Vav? Well, if you were a reader of the Bible, you know how many chapters of the Bible begin with the letter Vav, which is always translated in English as and, and the people, and this, and that. Where are all those ands? <laughs> so he too begins that way, and he begins in the evening, and he has the nation gathered there, and he says, um, this is, this is, um, it is there to receive its first wonder in 2,000 years. Now, to, to say that the nation, the nation is there to receive, is that not an evocation of Sinai? It, it, it does not, not, not tell us. I mean, when did the nation, when was the nation ever there as a nation to receive something? So there is the nation, a kind of a new Sinai, the first time, and more than 2,000, but, but this is since the destruction of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. So there is the nation gathered. And then, uh, and it is, you see the awe, the quiet that he builds up. It's night, it's evening, it's smoking. Where is that smoke coming from? What is all of that? Um, but then as darkness uh, is there and the moonlight comes, suddenly it's almost like a, a you know, one can think that this is a, a ceremony of, um, he, he uses the word tekes, tekes, which is the word for a ceremony. If you go to he, uh, any camp that uses Hebrew vocabulary, you will know this word, tekes, you know, that the, 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 the tekes for every uh, uh, ceremony and representation, right? So here's the nation waiting there standing, and who come towards it? A young boy and girl. The nation there and waiting in terror and joy at the same time. In terror and joy. That's the emotional scene. That's the emotional terror scene. Terror and joy together. Right. Okay, really and then the this feeling. young boy and this young girl And come. this young boy and girl come. It's not Moses from the Mount. You see, if you're thinking in, in large terms of a nation waiting in expectation, a young boy and a girl. Now, this is both true, I mean historically true, and very interestingly chosen. Not two soldiers, but a boy and a girl soldier, right? And they come and they're battle-weary, 
you see from the way that they're dressed that they're coming from the war. And they have not had time to clean up. So on the one hand, it's a ceremony. You know, everybody gathered for this ceremony and waiting, as you say, in awe and in joy. On the other hand, here they come and, and they're dirty and they're tired and they can hardly speak and uh, still bone weary from days and from nights in the field, in the crowd, and full of endless fatigue and they have no emotion any longer. Yet the dew of their youth, so the only water, they haven't had time to wash, but the dew of their youth is still on them. And they stand and you don't even know. They're so tired that they're, they're not shouting hurrah. They're not waving a flag. They're not saying victorious. No. They're, they're, you, you hardly know what to make of them. And then a nation in tears and amazed at this matter will ask, who are you? And the two will then say with a very silent, very soft voice, we are the silver platter on which the Jewish state was presented today. And he says, Medinat HaYehudim, the Jewish state, because this was still 1947, as you said, uh, five months, six months before the creation of the state, before the declaration of the state of Israel. So it did not yet have a name. So what does this mean? This young boy, this young girl, exhausted, yet the dew of their youth persisting. What does it mean when he says, we are the silver platter? What's he saying? Well, what's he saying? You see, the, the people who read it at the time knew exactly what he was saying in a way that we can't. He was saying the palmach. He was saying these were the strike units of the Jewish army in formation. It couldn't yet announce itself because the British did not allow it to exist. But these were the young, trained, uh, the kids who were trained for the most dangerous missions. And they were already fighting because the war was already on. They weren't waiting for the state to be declared. It would have, you know, they were already out there in the field. They were already battle weary. And so what it is saying is that you know, he said, the state would not be handed to you on a silver platter. Well, guess who the silver platter is? We. We, your teenagers. We are the ones who are fighting. And we are going to bring you this state. It's the fighters. It's the army in the making. It's we who are the kibbutznikim at that time, too, because the Palmach, you see, didn't have any money to sustain itself, so they had the brilliant idea of putting this Palmach into Kibbutzim, so they would both train there, work there, and that was a way of the army not having to pay them either. So these were very, very, you know, it was a time of tremendous self-sacrifice, and still is in the IDF, right? Um, so when I asked, um, a person that I know, a very wonderful Israeli that I know, um, asked her, um, did you ever learn this poem? And she said, no, I never learned it, but you know, we always knew it, uh, knew the poem. And, um, and I think that what she said, if I can understand the whole meaning behind it, that this is the, how shall I say, the responsibility that every young Jew in Israel grows up feeling. When you read that every year, we are the silver platter, you're the we. You're 17 years old, you're going into the IDF, you're going in for your army training. That's the we. So there's a tremendous identification with these young Palmach kids. Now you have an army, but you still have an army with uniform, with ceremonies, with washing up and all the rest of it. But everybody knows what it is to be out in the field and to be fighting. Uh, so as we, as we now try to bring these two poems together, 
we call this discussion tonight Jewish Calls for Freedom. And so we have this one vision of Jewish freedom from America, this one vision of a Jewish state hopefully about to be born, um, but born on the backs and blood of these young soldiers. Right. How do you make sense of these two poems together about the Jewish, thinking about the Jewish meaning of America and about the meaning of Israel as at their best these two centers of Jewish freedom? Well, they are, yes, I think that they are that and the poems are deeply meaningful. As I say, I mean, if you begin to read them, um, the wonderful thing about poems is that the more you read them, the more you live them, you, you absorb them, and you see things in them that you didn't see the first time, and you certainly see more in them than we've been able to say about them here. But I think one thing I would, since you said that this was also about poetry, I think that one of the things that one might keep in mind is that these poems define the nations to themselves. You see? Emma Lazarus does this for America. Natan Alterman does this for the state of Israel that is coming into being. So think of it. We think of poetry sometimes as a poetry, my feelings, my personal life, you know, my, and it is that. I mean, you know, we read when, and everybody sings these songs of Leonard Cohen and of Bob Dylan, and the, many of them are very personal and deep feeling and my lost love and all that. Well, yes, but you can see a, one poet can sometimes speak for a nation and can define a nation to itself in such a powerful way that the nation then experience itself, experiences itself through the words that were given to it by these poets. That's, that's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Well, look, as our students have taken this journey trying to understand the Jewish meaning of America, how it, um, Jewish ideas helped bring America into being or helped give America its purpose as, as a nation, Seeing these words in the Statue of Liberty is just another powerful example of that. Um, yes. But you've also helped bridge us for the next part of this journey, um, this miraculous rebirth of the Jewish state. Um, and that story, in a way, begins in the Jewish beginning. Um, but the modern version of it begins, in a way, around the very same time that Emma Lazarus wrote this poem. Right but where the Jewish situation in Europe and in Russia was becoming dark and tragic and, and the very opposite of freedom. And out of that pain, many heroic figures gave birth to the Jewish state. That's and this beautiful. poem that we read is almost like a cliffhanger, <laughs> something that we'll get to as we take that journey and something that takes us right to the very brink of that birth of modern Wonderful. Israel. So. <laughs> You've helped us understand these poems, and these poems have helped us understand a little better what we're trying to do in this course on these two exceptional, these two chosen, or these chosen and near chosen nations. So Hi. Professor Weiss, Hi. for being our guide tonight. Thank you. On behalf of all of our Truman scholars and their teachers and their families, we want to thank you. I feel so for privileged. Thank you, Eric, really. Thank you very, very much.